Once you've found the right doctor and have told him or her about your pain, don't be afraid to take what they give you. Often, it will be an opioid medication. Some patients may be afraid of taking opioids because they're perceived as too strong or addictive. But that is far from actual fact. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. And any drowsiness that might occur when you start to take the medication will soon wear off with most patients. Opioids are a class of drugs naturally found in the opium poppy plant. Some prescription opioids are made from the plant directly, and others are made by scientists in labs using the same chemical structure. Opioids are often used as medicines because they contain chemicals that relax the body and can relieve pain. The opioid crisis started in the mid-1990s. As an Uzi or, or, or a gun in their hand, uh, trying to make sure that they do know you and that you're not coming there to uh, rob them or, or try to get them. But you're a suburban housewife. What are you doing there? Getting my drugs. Money in hand. And just as quickly, the money passes through a hole in a boarded up building in exchange for the drug. But increasingly, it is not this business on which the dealers are thriving. It is money from buyers like this man, commuters from the suburbs to Harlem, where the drugs are plentiful, cheap, and available in the open. Commuter links like the George Washington Bridge, which carries residents of the New Jersey suburbs to New York, are being turned into drug connections. To combat the problem, cities like New Haven, Philadelphia, and Miami are mounting frequent sting operations. The first wave began with increased prescribing of opioids back then. Very startling and stark uh, report that exposes, uh, you know, we were looking at the emails that sales personnel were sending back and forth about the 2,000% markup on the stuff and how easy it is to get people accustomed to using it. There's no question what went on there. The state's 271-page complaint against Purdue Pharma claims Dr. Pogue prescribed more OxyContin than any other doctor in the state for years. It says Purdue ordered its sales force to target top prescribing doctors like Pogue, despite red flags that indicated he was over-prescribing pain pills and they were being illegally sold on the streets. According to the lawsuit, Purdue executives were immediately made aware of our report after a Purdue sales manager forwarded the story to the company's lawyers. He wrote, this involves Dr. James Pogue, who has been reported to your law department in the past. But sales representatives kept going to Pogue's office, encouraging him to sell more pills. The lawsuit says he was not put on the company's cease calling status until 75 days after Purdue's law department was made aware of the News Channel 5 story. With overdose deaths involving prescription opioids, both natural and semi-synthetic, and methadone, this increased since at least 1999. With what he finds at a busy intersection. And I got a white male, approximately 25 years old. Blue in the face. So I need help now. You can hear him trying to revive the young man. <laughs> man who authorities believe couldn't wait to get home from work, shooting up in his car. The panic driver who called 911 a father on his way home from work. He tells us he gave that young man mouth to mouth because he knew what he was witnessing. It is everywhere, even in his own home. You know something, I, I lost my son to a drug overdose. Uh, thank God I didn't have to do what I did for him. I miss him dearly. Over the course of a year, we've met so many parents who never thought it would be their child. Sabrina Bimbenek. Spencer's world was football. The boy loved to play. Doug Griffin. Courtney was a lot of fun. She would bring a smile to everybody's face. Four out of five new heroin users begin with prescription pain pills. Spencer got hurt in a game. The Oxycontin. Pills, then heroin. Spencer switched over to heroin. 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 The police came to my door at one o'clock in the morning and said my son was gone. One of the cornerstones of Purdue's marketing plan 
was the use of sophisticated marketing data to influence physicians' prescribing. Drug companies compile prescriber profiles on individual physicians, detailing the prescribing patients of physicians nationwide in an effort to influence doctors' prescribing habits. Which falls far short of what we know they could have uh, given the state of medical science. There's a major misconception, I think, in the medical profession that pain treatment consists largely of pain management and people seem to mean by that that you can only teach patients in pain to live with their pain and so often I hear that back from the patients that all the doctor could offer was help living with the pain. Well that's not what pain treatment is. Uh, we don't treat diabetes or asthma by teaching people how to live with their diabetes and asthma. We treat the diabetes and asthma, that is, we shut it down as far as we can. We treat it, we reduce it, we make it better. That's what we can be doing and that's what we should be doing with pain. We should be treating it, we should be making it better, not simply helping patients live with it. Well, I didn't, I didn't have no knowledge of it, number one. Number two, um, it influenced my life. It helped me. It really did because I used it because I was really in a lot of pain at the time that I started using it. You know, um, then I went through two different surgery, surgeries. You know, I had spine surgery up here and in the back. It affected my life in a lot of ways because I was on opioid, opioids for about eight years. I never really personally got addicted to it because I didn't take them as much because I knew it was going to be addicted. So, you know, but it helped me with my pain. It was very good for my pain, but it was scary because everybody's talking about people ODing, people's, you know, um, getting addicted to it. And I've seen a lot of cases where people did get addicted to it. The experience I had was um, a friend of mine came to my house to visit and we were sitting around having drinks and everything. And I went out on the porch and I came back in he was non-responsive. I said, hey, buddy, what's going on? How you doing? What's up? He wouldn't say nothing. I'm like, oh, I know. Because he's, he's a practical joker. So I'm saying, I know this joker. He, he's playing with me. I think he was, I thought he was playing with me. So I started shaking him and everything. And I smacked him. No response. I said, Lord, help me. I don't know what we're going to do. So what I did was try to shake him some more. So what I did was call 911. I said, this guy's not moving or nothing. I don't know what happened to him. You know, I don't know if he took something white, I don't know. And the lady was very, very kind to me. And she said, just lay him on the floor and we're sending help right now. And so they came and it was no problem. They came, did what they did, took him out, didn't ask me no questions or nothing. You know, so you don't have to be afraid to call the um, authorities, you know, on people who's old in. You didn't put, I didn't put it in them. I didn't even know he was taking it. You know, here go another situation like I just told you. Didn't even know the person was taking drugs like that. In my house, did. They had hit him two times. But I thank God that I called somebody, you know, and I didn't panic. I said, oh no, we got, we got to do this right. You know, because before, like I told you, the friend of mine, TOD because nobody called, you know. But the thing is, is that, you know, it's very powerful. You know, and then nowadays, you don't even know what people are putting in what. They put in the marijuana, they put it in cocaine, they put it in the marijuana, they put it in pills. They doing all kinds of crazy stuff with this stuff. So you need to be very careful, very careful out here. If you're going to do drugs or whatever you do, you know, you got to make sure you hopefully getting it from the right person. And then you don't even know they know who they getting it from, you know, so. Just be careful, because it was very traumatic for me. Very, very, man. I mean, I mean, you know, I knew this person for like 30 years. You know, and to see him to die, almost die in my house, it was like very emotional. You know, and very um, trying. I was scared. I said, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my apartment. I'm gonna do it. But I didn't care about that. I cared about his life. You understand what I'm saying? I cared about his life. Did you know that opioid overdoses currently kill more U.S. citizens than AIDS and HIV did at its prime in 1995? The number is so exponential that it has surpassed multiple other epidemics, such as the crack epidemic, the meth epidemic, and the heroin epidemic combined. Purdue promoted among primary care physicians a more liberal use of opioids 
particularly sustained release opioids. Primary care physicians begin to use more of the increasingly popular OxyContin by 2003. Nearly half of all physicians prescribing OxyContin were primary care physicians. Some experts were concerned that primary care physicians were not sufficiently trained in pain management or addiction issues. Primary care physicians, particularly in a managed care environment of time constraints, also had the least amount of time for evaluation and follow-up of patients with complicated chronic pain. Yes, um, the opioid crisis is a large crisis in Delaware. Um, it's far-reaching, and as some know and some may not know, <clears throat> it's, it's even larger than we can even have imagined. <laughs> um, I'm a social worker, licensed social worker um, for the state of Delaware. And even as a social worker, a lot of times things are kind of pushed to the side. Uh, working with families and out in the community <laughs> for over 20 something years. And I actually started around the time in the 80s when there was the uh, crack epidemic. And this is similar to it. The only difference is, is that I see where it's more help and more medical help and it's decriminalized. You know, a lot of families were turn, torn apart during that time because crack was looked at as not, not so much as how it hurt, hurt families, separated families, but it was looked at as um, I'm really a money maker by making it in the criminal justice system. And some people haven't even bounced back from that, even though it's been many years. <clears throat> now we have this new epidemic where it's tearing up families. Children are placed out of their homes because it may be two, two parents that are affected by this, or maybe a parent that's already incarcerated. And now the other parent um, has an, an addiction to opioids. Um, I've had families in the past where it started off as innocent as them getting hurt seriously in a car accident <clears throat> or having some accident where um, they were hurt at work or, or whatever the situation was. But the doctors and the pharmaceutical um, companies have to take responsibility because they were giving so many high doses just to keep people out of pain. And they weren't really managing the pain uh, people were just trying to get out of the pain, as we know that sometimes it's physical pain, sometimes it's emotional pain, and it's a lot of hurting people out here. Um, the community, uh, the community of color, has really been hit hard because a lot of our children are already looked at as tossaways and giveaway children, <clears throat> and now many of them are, are being put in the hands of whether it's the government or people who are not in caring and as in loving as, and they're disconnected from their family. And it goes generations, it's, it goes down generations. You know, we look at it, it's, it's just, it's not just affecting Johnny, it's affecting the whole community, the whole village that Johnny lives in. <clears throat> um, when I think about um, what are some solutions, you know, we often hear people talk about, we should do this and do that, but talk is cheap. We need to actually put our hands to work. You know, we have a saying at, um, at our church, God's work in our hands. But if we really look at all the people that are being hurt, our hands aren't being put to use as much as our mouth, just lip service. I feel like now is a really a serious time where so many young people are being targeted with these um, with these type of drugs. You know, they're being taught to, I feel down here, come feel, take this to feel up. But you only stay up for a certain amount of time and then you're down again, having different issues. Issues are deeper than just, I don't feel good or I feel sad. It needs to be more help with mental health. The churches need to be more open-minded and giving and helping different populations and spreading love. I think love needs to be at the core of it <clears throat> because a lot of times people are reaching out and what they're, what they're coming back with is something, a handful of drugs to make them feel better or what they think makes them feel better, but you're not, you're putting a Band-Aid on something that needs more than just a Band-Aid. It needs to start from the core. The second wave of opioids started in 2010 
with an increase in deaths involving heroin, started to rise, and only three years later, a third wave would hit, increasing in synthetic opioids hitting the market, leading to more overdose deaths in 2013. The Future of Drug Use The FDA is making large efforts to provide guidance, knowledge, and advisory to the public on harms of abusing prescription drugs. Making citizens aware of the harms of misusing opioids can have a beneficial effect on the future of drug use in the U.S. Opioids carry a large risk of dependency, and there needs to be more resources available to those who are at risk of abusing opioids so that they understand how these drugs can easily become addictive. Whereas former decades did not have the advocacy of organizations that set out to inform the public of the harms associated with drug misuse, today the resources are plentiful. The overarching goal is to help doctors and patients make informed decisions when considering these powerful drugs to treat pain. Walking in the shadows, landscape from the things I want.